You're listening to Heroes and Villains with Bruce Leslie. I wanna live in a world full of heroes. Not sit here counting zeros in a cubicle downtown. I wanna look out my window, see them flying and swing across the horizon as I cheer them on so proud. And welcome to another episode of Heroes and Villains, the podcast that talks all about characters from comic books and related media, and dares to ask, how much do you really know? Uh, This episode that I'm talking about uh, is based on the Marvel character, Dr. Bill Foster, also known as Black Goliath, also known as Goliath, also known as Giant Man. Uh, Dr. Foster was created by Stan Lee and Don Heck in The Avengers, number 32, uh, with the cover date September 1966. And his Black Goliath persona was created by Tony Isabella and George Tusca in Luke Cage Power Man, number 24, with the cover date April 1975. Now, I always start off talking about my personal experience with the character, and the first thing I want to do is acknowledge that this topic was requested via Facebook by listener Nick Joseph. So I'm glad to get this one done, and thank you very much for listening, Nick. Now, when it comes to, you know, what do I know about the character, my personal experience with the character, I think I ran across this character with the Defenders. Uh, Maybe it was the West Coast Avengers, like a comic that I wasn't a a frequent reader of, but I would pick up from time to time because they just kind of had cool characters. I'm not real sure, to be honest. Uh, He's one of those characters that, well, I always sort of knew he was around, but I never really read him much. And honestly, my strongest connection, my clearest memories of Bill Foster, just go back to the recent Ant-Man movie, the second Ant-Man movie. uh, It was titled Ant-Man and the Wasp. Now, physical appearance. What does Dr. Bill Foster Goliath look like? Well, he's an adult human male. He's a person of color, an African American. Uh, His baseline height is six feet tall. He has a muscular build and he's got so many costumes, so many costumes. It's hard to know where to start here with costumes, but I'll say this. He seems to avoid capes. So I guess that's a good place to start as good as any, I, I, I suppose. Now I'll use a couple of his official pictures. Uh, There's a picture from the all-new official handbook of the Marvel Universe. In this picture, uh, Goliath is wearing a skin-tight bodysuit with short sleeves on a white shirt. And this white shirt has like a blue V-shaped region around the neck and shoulders area. This uh, V-shaped region dips down down the middle of his chest to the upper part of his abdomen. He has blue long-legged pants, long-legged pants to differentiate them from short-legged pants. Uh, He also has a blue belt with a giant buckle that has a big yellow G on it. He has blue boots with like white bands around his calves. And those white bands around his calves, honestly, they remind me of like the weights that I haven't seen them a lot lately. But I know like when I was younger, I would see these weights you could put on your ankles to run with and exercise with and stuff. That's almost what those bands around his calves kind of look like to me. Uh, His hands, he has white gloves, uh, white gloves that stop at his wrist, almost like driving gloves or something, or batting gloves if you're a baseball fan. And then he has blue wristbands around the wrist of uh, each hand. And then he also wears a blue domino mask in this picture. Now there's a picture from the official handbook of the Marvel Universe, which is older than the all-new official handbook of the Marvel Universe. So this is an older costume. But he has a skin-tight, long-sleeved white shirt, as opposed to that short-sleeved shirt from the all-new version. But this long-sleeved white shirt is also open to the waist uh, to show off his muscly chest real well. Uh, It has a somewhat large collar on the shirt, like not uh, ridiculously large, but it's definitely like butterfly collar territory on that shirt. And he has big, oversized gold buttons on either side of that open part of his shirt that's running down his chest. He has like these three big gold buttons on each side for a total of six gold buttons on that shirt. And then there's like this really thin gold cord 
that extends across uh, his exposed chest from the button on one side to the button on the other. They just go straight across, no crisscross or lacing action or anything. Uh, as far as his pants, he has skin-tight, long-legged turquoise pants. Uh, he matches those with some white buccaneer boots, a uh, black belt with a big yellow G on the buckle, turquoise gauntlets, and a gold domino mask on this incarnation. And then I've seen this other third version that's kind of crazy, so it's worth talking about. But uh, there's uh, sort of third versions or variations where he has a skin-tight blue bodysuit, but it's got like this rectangular cutout uh, on the shirt. That's It's like it's cut out to show off his, his nice muscular abs, really showing those abs off with, you know, kind of like a Power Girl thing, only it's the abs instead of the chest. And then it's paired with this super high disco collar. I mean, the collar goes as high as his head does, like Dr. Strange territory here. Uh, he wears a, a blue mask with this one. It's like a cowl, but it's like one of those topless cowls. It's a cowl that lets your hair fluff out. I call this like a Marvel style mask. Also, Firestorm kind of sports a mask like this. So that's at least three incarnations of his costumes, and I'm sure there are others out there that you can always write in and tell me, hey, I missed this one and it was my favorite or whatever, but, you know, I gave you three and did the best I can. This is sometimes the toughest part is the physical appearance. Uh, now, when it comes to the powers, we'll start with just Bill Foster, Dr. Bill Foster. He is a doctor because he has a Ph.D. in biochemistry, so he's an accomplished academic and he's a brilliant biochemist with gifted intellect. Now, his superhuman powers that he possesses, because, you know, he is a superhero after all. Well, his superhuman powers are a result of his ingestion of a biochemical formula containing PIM particles. So the same kind of thing that makes uh, Hank PIM giant man is the sort of thing that makes Bill Foster giant man and Goliath and Black Goliath. Uh, he has the ability to increase his size and mass to a gigantic size. And the way that he does that is he psionically draws extra mass from an extra dimensional source. That's what the PIM particles allow him to do. And he does this while also gaining superhuman strength in proportion to his height. So what's the brass tacks? What does this mean in terms of raw data? Well, he's able to grow to 15 feet in height. For those of you on the metric system, that's 4.6 meters high. So that's pretty tall, 15 feet. That's, uh, you know, if you're a basketball fan, that's like the free throw line to the baseline's 15 feet, right? Do I remember that much from when I played basketball? And uh, he can lift approximately 10 tons at that height. So uh, they say that's proportional, but he's six feet at his baseline. So it's, that would mean he can, what, lift three tons at his baseline? I don't know. Far be it from me to dispute the physics of comic books. But it says he can lift about 10 tons when he grows to 15 feet tall. That sounds disproportionate to me. But, what you know, I'm not exactly the strongest guy, so I shouldn't complain. Now, there was a comic book event called uh, Evolutionary War. And in this comic book event, his powers kind of got a boost, a power up, if you will. So his power increased and he demonstrated the ability to grow to 25 feet. That's 7.6 meters in height. Now, one of the drawbacks, you know, every everybody with powers needs to have a weakness. Superman has to have his kryptonite. Uh, I don't know. The Martian Manhunter has to have Oreos that he can't resist. But when it comes to Black Goliath, the process of changing height is fatiguing to him. So Foster becomes more vulnerable to harm after he goes from big back to being small again. Like he has this refractory period where he's wiped out. So let's move on to the character biography of Dr. Bill Foster. And I got the uh, information again. Uh, this is something, you know, in the, when I stopped doing this a couple of years ago, I was doing it pretty regular, and I didn't have this really good Marvel source for these Marvel characters, but now there seems to be this improved uh, sort of character encyclopedia on Marvel.com. So just like I got Green Goblin's info from Marvel.com, that's the same thing I did with William Foster. So please feel free to go to Marvel.com and read this for yourself, but uh, I'll paraphrase sometimes. Sometimes I'll just give it to you word for word, but here we go. William Foster spent his childhood in the neighborhood of Watts, uh, Watts in California near Los Angeles. Uh, I think Watts is where Sanford and Son was set, if I remember correctly. I was a big fan of that show. If you've ever read uh, Nerd Spawn Genesis, you can probably tell I was a fan of Sanford and Son. Marvel Comics describes Watts as a ghetto, which is where William Foster grew up. Uh, his natural intelligence, 
uh, along with having the benefit of several positive influences in his life, helped him make his way out of Watts, and he attended California Technical Institute, which I believe is a fictional version of California Institute of Technology. California Institute of Technology, of course, a super, super prestigious uh, scientific based university. I mean, I'm sure it's prestigious for other stuff, but I just know, I think that's where uh, uh, Richard Feynman was at California Institute of Technology, if I remember correctly. A lot of Nobel laureates on staff at California Institute of Technology, at least in the past. Uh, But before he went to California Technical Institute, he did uh, do a stint as an enlisted man in the military. While it was in the military, he saw combat in what Marvel calls Southeast Asia, Uh, You look at the timeline, he first appeared, what did I say, 1966, I think I said, is when he first appeared. So, gee, depending on how old he was in 1966, maybe he got the tail end of Korea. Uh, But, you know, in later incarnations, you know, by the 70s, I think we're all assuming that was Vietnam, that's Southeast Asia. And while he was there, he made an enemy. And it wasn't just any enemy, it was a powerful enemy. It was a guy in the CIA there was this CIA agent named Jeffrey Ballard who went on to become a uh, sort of a rogue super agent known as the Centurion. Now, when uh, Foster, you know, did his stint in the military, did his tour of duty, he became a student and he started working toward a degree in biochemistry. And while he was away at college doing the uh, student thing, of course, he was, uh, you know, trying to make friends with some of the uh, smart talented, attractive young co-eds there, and he met a uh, co-ed who would catch his eye named Claire Temple. Now, I know a lot of longtime comic book fans know who Claire Temple is, but let's say you're more of a, of a TV and movie kind of guy. You would know Claire Temple as the character that uh, Rosario Dawson portrayed in multiple Marvel Netflix shows. I think she showed up in pretty much all the shows as the nurse Claire Temple, but uh, she's actually a medical student in the comics when Foster met her, when Bill Foster met her, and they hit it off. They got married. I don't know if you knew this, but Bill Foster was married to Claire Temple in the comics. Uh, When we think about the live-action versions, that seems a little unexpected, but, you know, life is unexpected. Now, after he managed to graduate, he went to work in corporate America with his scientific prowess. He went to work at Stark Industries, where he did a great job. By all accounts, he was an excellent employee, worked his way up the corporate ladder. Uh, But the problem is he had this drive for success. Like he was really married to his job, you could say. And this caused the waters to be a little bit rocky at home. So it strained his marriage with Claire Temple. And eventually she decided that he cared more about his work than he did about her. Or maybe he decided that. I'm not going to be assigning blame here. But the the point of it all is that that marriage failed and it wound up in divorce. Uh, now, we, we want to talk a little bit about Hank Pym, Henry Pym, because you can't talk about Bill Foster without talking about Henry Pym, who is uh, described here as a scientific adventurer, and he got stuck in his bigger form. He got stuck at 10 feet. So when Henry Pym, Hank Pym, I don't like to say Henry, When Hank Pym was stuck at 10 feet, Tony Stark said, you know what? I've got this whiz bang of a scientist here working at Stark Industries. He's an expert in biochemistry. Uh, His name's Bill Foster. I think uh, he could probably help you find a cure, Dr. Pym. So for several months, Bill Foster and Hank Pym worked together in Pym's laboratories in New Jersey. They also worked some at the uh, Avengers Mansion and... Uh, This is when Bill Foster is still just Bill Foster, extraordinarily gifted scientist, and he found himself embroiled with some of the Avengers cases. Like there was a a time when the uh, uh, attacks uh, by this group called the Sons of the Serpent on Avengers Mansion uh, happened at a time when Foster was there. So Bill Foster survived those attacks with no superpowers, only with his wits. He also helped to thwart... Uh, this attempt by a, a villain called Whirlwind to kill Hank Pym and the Wasp, Janet Van Dyne. Uh, this this villain, Whirlwind, wanted to claim their estate, tried to kill the both of them, and Hank Pym uh, was very thankful to have his assistant, Bill Foster, on hand to help him bail him out of that one. And working together, the two scientists eventually found a cure for Hank Pym's case of gigantism, I guess we could call it. 
So after Hank was cured and he was able to go back to his normal size, Foster returned to Stark Industries where, you know, he had some seniority, a good career going there. And he had done such a good job in his time with Hank Pym that he'd earned some further respect, I guess, from uh, Tony Stark. So he was promoted to be head of the biochemistry division at Stark Industries at the Los Angeles plant. Uh, So he went from East Coast to West Coast at that point in time, which is good. You know, he's a West Coast guy from Watts, went to California Technological Institute. But he was fascinated by Pym's research from the time he spent with Hank Pym. So he synthesized the growth compound, uh, but he was hoping that he could make a better version of it than what uh, Hank Pym had been working with. He was hoping he could eliminate any of the side effects that seemed to go along with Pym's formula. So eventually, uh, eventually Bill Foster tested this growth formula on himself, and he found he had successfully duplicated Hank Pym's growing powers. So he took a vacation from his duties at Stark Industries, and he devised a plan that he thought, I mean, the whole point of all this is the whole point of many a poor, misguided fellow's uh, uh, energies and efforts. He was hoping, basically, to, to use all this to win back the love of his ex-wife, Claire Temple. He really wanted to get Claire back in his life, maybe, you know, give marriage another try with her. So he wrote her a letter about how he'd worked with Hank Pym, uh, how he duplicated Hank Pym's growing powers, but he made her believe uh, that he was trapped in giant stature. But it's real important to understand he was not trapped in giant stature. He basically lied to her to sort of play on her heartstrings and maybe get her back in his life. Um, You know, I'm not the best person to be given romantic advice, but I will say this. Don't don't be lying to people you care about. It just never works out. You know, don't lie about something to try to get somebody to come back to you. That's 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 just a terrible thing. Regardless of whether it was good or bad, she agreed to meet him to see what kind of help she could give him. I mean, she's a medical professional, too, you know, so they met at a traveling circus. Now, this is where this lie goes into pure crazy territory. Like, you know, this this is not this is not good here, Mr. Foster. He had her meet him at a traveling circus because he said that the only way he could work to earn any money was to be like this this giant in the circus because he couldn't work for Stark anymore, which is all a lie. He could have continued working for Stark. He had the ability to go back to normal size whenever he wanted to. But rather than do that, he built this elaborate lie to try to get Claire back. So he's traveling in the circus. Uh, He claims he's doing this to earn money to fund his research. And I don't know how well circuses paid back in the 70s, but I would imagine circus workers don't really have the same kind of research funding that like NIH or the NSI or somebody would. But anyway, that's what he's doing. Now, he had to make himself an outfit. Uh, You know, people in the circus, circus entertainers, they don't just wear street clothes. They wear flashy outfits. So he made that uh, first or actually that second outfit I described, which was the first one in the comics. And this is the first time he started calling himself Black Goliath. That was his circus performer name. You know, sell tickets to the public, buy your ticket, come in and see the Black Goliath. Now, Claire hadn't just, you know, stood still and spun her wheels. After that relationship fell apart with Bill Foster, she moved on. So she had a new boyfriend. And this new boyfriend wasn't just anybody. This new boyfriend was Luke Cage, the superhero power man. Luke Cage, Heroes for Hire fame. Well, that was her current boyfriend. So when Claire leaves town to go meet some uh, performer in the circus, I guess Luke Cage was curious or worried or I don't know what he was, but he was following her. That's what he was doing. So he followed her. He saw Black Goliath. And then next thing you know, Black Goliath and Power Man are fighting over the affections of Claire. And I don't mean like having a verbal argument. I mean, this is comic books. So we have the Black Goliath versus Power Man uh, battle on the pages of the comics. However, uh, as this fight's going on, it just so happens that uh, the circus of crime was the circus, the traveling circus that Black Goliath joined out of all the circuses, you know, no Ringling Brothers, no Barnum and Bailey, no whatever else there was back then. He happened to join the circus of crime. So the ringmaster, the the famous evil villain from the Circus of Crime, shows up. 
and uh, Luke Cage and Bill Foster stop fighting each other long enough to team up and defeat the ringmaster. However, after all of these events are over, you know, after the, the ex-husband and the current boyfriend get in their knockdown drag out fight and fight off the villain ringmaster, Claire's, you know, like, I don't have any time for this foolishness, Bill. Uh, she stays with Luke Cage rather than, you know, go back to her ex-husband who lied and tricked her and tried to fight her current boyfriend. Like, all those things are just terrible, terrible things to do. So Bill Foster's ashamed. I guess it's like a, a wake-up moment, if you will. He sort of has his eyes open to how misguided all of this was. So he returns to Los Angeles. Now, he made this costume for himself, and he had fought a villain using this costume but he didn't know if he should use it to fight crime or not because he thought, you know, this was me being a circus performer and I did it to lie to my ex-wife to get her to come back to me. You know, there was a lot of shame around this costume and this black Goliath persona. So he wasn't really sure whether or not he should use this as like a superhero persona. He wasn't sure if he should use it to fight crime. But with a little bit of encouragement from Hank Pym, who, you know, by the way, if you haven't, go listen to that two-part Hank Pym episode and you'll see that hank pym is not a great person to take advice from in his own right but anyway with some encouragement from hank pym bill foster decides to try and fight crime as black goliath in that circus costume so on his first outing he runs up against a criminal named adam smasher and man this gets me confused because i would swear i would bet dollars to donuts that adam smasher was like a uh, almost like a uh, golden age or early silver age dc comics character you know and and maybe maybe there's more than one atom smasher out there that's that's something that got me like really confused when i was reading these notes but there's clearly an atom smasher from marvel comics and uh that atom smasher from marvel comics is not to be confused with haha i found it albert rothstein was the name of a superhero in dc comics named atom smasher uh, one of the differences is the Marvel Comics Adam Smasher has a hyphen in his name. So it's Adam hyphen Smasher. The DC Comics Adam Smasher came way later, came in 1999. So I was a little bit off on my timeline there. So back to the story. Sorry for that little digression. But Bill Foster encounters a criminal called Adam Smasher who bombards him with deadly radiation. This Adam Smasher was a person named Ronald English. Now, all this radiation that Foster's bombarded with, it starts to cause painful side effects, and it makes his size transformations difficult. It causes him to occasionally black out, you know, the results of that fight. And before Foster is able to defeat Adam Smasher, he's been seriously handicapped, if you will, from this radiation sneak attack. Then a mysterious assassin shows up and kills Adam Smasher. So Bill Foster fighting the bad guy. Out of nowhere, the bad guy gets uh, sort of bushwhacked and killed by a mysterious assassin. Later on, to make this even more confusing, or at least more bizarre, I should say, we find out that that mysterious assassin was Adam Smasher's brother, who would go on to become the second Adam Smasher. So Bill Foster ignores his radiation poisoning, like a lot of stubborn people do. He ignores the symptoms of the radiation po uh, poisoning. He continues on his career, you know, as a superhero. He battles Vulcan as another bad guy. He battles Stiltman, you know, one of the classic corny Marvel villains, Stiltman. Uh, he, he ends up working with the champions for a little while. He works alongside the Thing for a little while. And after some time passes, Foster changes his name from black goliath to giant man which of course giant man is a name that hank pym used in his big form for quite a while but at this point hank pym's no longer using that name and foster picks it up well the radiation sickness doesn't just stand still you know it's not something that just gets better on its own it, it actually was a little bit progressive and it became difficult for bill uh, for mr foster dr foster goliath giant man call him what you will became difficult to ignore the radiation sickness so he took a leave of absence from Stark International, and uh, he became a consultant at Project Pegasus. And this was an upstate New York energy research installation facility. He went there to do research on the corpse of the Atom Smasher. 
the very guy who radiation poisoned him in the first place. And he nearly sacrificed his life to stop the mad scheme of the Nth Man. Now, I did a whole episode on the Nth Man, who's great, a Larry Hama creation. You should go back and check out Nth Man. That's an episode. That was a character I didn't know much about until a really uh, cool listener who agreed to be a guest, Paws Man. Uh, he came on and we talked about Nth Man, so you should go back and check that one out. Well, following the attack from Nth Man, uh, a team of top radiologists, that's the term Marvel uses, a team of top radiologists, but I would say more like nuclear physicists, uh, people who study the physics of radiation, the, re the results of radiation poisoning, because a radiologist is like the guy that reads your MRI, your CT scan, your x-rays or whatever. But you know what? I'll, I'll forgive Marvel for maybe using that term incorrectly. But they get what I, I can't help it. I'm just going to say nuclear physicists. A team of nuclear physicists were assigned to help cure Bill Foster's condition, to help treat and find a resolution to his radiation poisoning. Uh, among that team were Reed Richards, uh, of course, Reed Richards, Mr. Fantastic of the Fantastic Four, and Walter Lankowski, who is also known as Sasquatch, who I did a great episode on Walter Lankowski with my good, good friend Chris Elvins, if you want to go back and listen to the Sasquatch episode. Unfortunately, the treatments failed. After those treatments failed, Foster went back to Los Angeles to finish, you know, his life's work with Stark Industries. And while he's there, he gets attacked by the second Adam Smasher, Michael English, the brother of Ronald English, who sort of killed the first Adam Smasher while he was battling against Bill Foster in his Goliath persona. So the Thing, Spider-Woman, they showed up. They helped Bill Foster. They helped Giant Man defeat the second Atom Smasher. And then Spider-Woman went on to save Bill Foster's life with the transfusion of her blood. Uh, the problem was when she gave him the blood transfusion, somehow it caused her to lose her own power of immunity to radiation. So I can't explain that one. That's beyond my uh, ability to comprehend. But Bill Foster believed his cell structure had deteriorated to the point that he could never become Giant Man again. So he retired and became a full-time researcher. I think that's pretty noble, you know? Nothing wrong with that. And during this time, he became a consultant to the Avengers when they opened the West Coast base. You know, that's where I think I might have seen him show up in the West Coast Avengers comics. Eventually, Foster found himself working for a bad guy. He found himself working as a technician for the high evolutionary at his Antarctic stronghold. Uh, of course, he didn't know he was working for a bad guy, at least not at first. But while he was using his biochemical expertise working for the high evolutionary, he discovered uh, about the high evolutionary. Ah, that's a hard one for me. He learned that the high evolutionary had this plan to mutate everyone on Earth. So he managed to release a warning to the West Coast Avengers. They tracked him all the way to Antarctica. And as the Avengers were being defeated, Bill Foster swallowed some kind of a chemical that transformed him into Giant Man again. And he learned that his uh, cellular disintegration had been cured. So, you know, that's a long way of saying he found out he had his powers back, got his powers back, still had his powers, whatever you want to say. So he, he defeated the High Evolutionary in combat. He was uh, invited to join the West Coast Avengers full-time, but he declined that invitation. He just wanted to go back to being a man of science. He returned to his research, and he uh, renewed that relationship he had, that long-standing research partnership with, with Hank Pym for a time. And uh, along with that renewed relationship with Pym, he also renewed his occasional association with the Avengers. Uh, he helped Pym save the life of the second swordsman who was uh, staying at the Avengers mansion at that point in time. Later on, Foster and Pym learned of a potential invasion from the dimension of Cosmos. And the dimension of Cosmos is apparently the, division, uh, the dimension from which Bill Foster and Hank Pym both derived their powers. So after working together to thwart that attempt, Bill Foster found himself without his powers again. I guess, you know, the events of battling the people from the very dimension that empowers you left him powerless. So he went right back to the good old reliable scientific research. And he probably would have been better off just staying in the lab, to be honest, because when he restores his growth powers and he takes up his black Goliath identity again, 
He uh, works alongside Black Panther, Falcon, Luke Cage, and Iron Fist uh, to fight a gang of criminals. Later on, he assisted the uh, Avengers during the Red Zone Crisis. He modifies his costume a little bit, gives us that first costume I described, and he takes up the new alias of just simply Goliath. He teams up with the Thing to defeat the Cauldron, uh, or his name is Cauldron, the Scalding Man, I should say. And then he went on during Civil War to oppose the Superhero Registration Act. So he uh, joined Team Cap and the Secret Avengers during Civil War. And this is where I'm saying he might have been better off just staying in the lab because, unfortunately, during the events of Secret War, uh, he had a clash with Iron Man's squad of Registration Act supporters. He fought along Ragnarok. I don't know how much you remember about Ragnarok. Uh, Ragnarok was like this clone of Thor that fought on Team Registration, Team Iron Man. And unfortunately, during that battle, Bill Foster was killed by Ragnarok. So that is sort of the end of Bill Foster's story. Now, I don't think he's popped up since Civil War, but you know how comics go. I'm sure we'll be seeing him again one of these days. So let's move on to multimedia. Not a lot to talk about here with uh, Bill Foster and multimedia, but as I mentioned at the top of the show with the uh, personal experience, Bill Foster did appear in Ant-Man and the Wasp. He was played by Lawrence Fishburne, and I think he talked about calling himself Goliath, and there were some flashbacks to him in his giant size or talking about his giant size. So we did get not only Bill Foster portrayed by Lawrence Fishburne and a flashback to a young Bill Foster by a CGI de-aged Lawrence Fishburne, but we also got some reference to Goliath. Uh, That's the only multimedia appearance. I was shocked that he didn't show up in like Avengers, Earth's Mightiest Heroes. He didn't show up in any any of the animated stuff. I was kind of surprised by that. But he has shown up in some video games. Uh, His Goliath persona appears in Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2. Uh, Goliath is a playable character in Marvel Superhero Squad Online. And Black Goliath is a playable character in Lego Marvel's Avengers. That's a game I've gotten. I've played a lot. I never noticed, uh, never played as Black Goliath on that one. So we'll talk about some influences, things that influenced Black Goliath and maybe vice versa. But we're going to start with just the, the name Goliath. I'm sure we, most of us probably know where that comes from, but for completeness sake, I'll talk a little bit about Goliath, who's described in the book of Samuel in the Bible as a Philistine giant. He was defeated by the young David in single combat. Uh, The Dead Sea Scrolls text uh, of the book Samuel from the first century before the current era, uh, it gives his height as four cubits in a span. Uh, which translates to 6 feet 9 inches or 2.06 meters tall. And I'll grant you, that's a big guy. I'm not going around picking a fight with somebody who's 6'9", but I I don't know if I go so far as to call somebody 6'9", a giant these days. You know, in in past eras, probably people didn't get quite as tall. But, you know, 6'9", is like a, uh, I mean, what, what, that's a small forward, a shooting guard in the NBA. You know, there's a lot of folks 6'9", now. However, this is what I like is something called the Masoretic text, and I'm no scholar when it comes to these uh, issues, so I do apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong. It looks like Masoretic to me, but it says his height was six cubits in a span, which is nine feet, nine inches, or 2.97 meters, and I say that's more like it. Now, that's what I call a giant, nine, nine feet, nine inches. There's no two ways around it. That is a giant. Uh, The underlying purpose, this is some more commentary I saw about Goliath, the biblical Goliath. It says, the underlying purpose of the story of Goliath is to show that Saul is not fit to be king. And, you know, David becomes the king, King David. I think a lot of people know that story. Well, anyway, I'm wondering if maybe in the comics they're speaking to the unfitness of Hank Pym. Like Hank Pym, maybe the Saul in that story. I don't know. That might be a reach, but, you know, Hank Pym quite unstable throughout his years in the comics. Once again, I got a whole two-part episode, I think, of Hank Pym you can go back and listen to. Uh, Speaking of Hank Pym, obviously, obviously Hank Pym is an influence on Goliath, Black Goliath, Giant Man. I mean, Hank Pym, the Pym Particles, that's where his power came from. I think Hank Pym used the name Goliath and Giant Man prior to Bill Foster 
So that's like a direct legacy almost, you know, one-to-one influence there. And then, you know, whether they were influenced by Bill Foster or Bill Foster was influenced by them, just the other growing characters out there in comic books, the ones whose powers are to grow to a big size. For me, that always starts first and foremost with the Super Friends and the character Apache Chief. Now, according to Looper.com, which was a website I ran across when I was just kind of researching influences for Bill Foster, uh, Looper.com says, and this is a quote that's Looper, L-O-O-P-E-R. Looper.com says, and I quote, Marvel's that Bill Foster is Marvel's attempts or part of Marvel's attempts to cash in on the Hollywood black exploitation trend uh, that won him the short lived series Black Goliath. End quote. So when I talked about, uh, probably uh, when I talked about Luke Cage more than anybody else, I talked about the influence of black black exploitation on comics during that time period. And those same influences are probably at play with Black Goliath. Uh, recommendations. Uh, what can I recommend to read, to watch, to listen to, to check out? If you want to get to know Black Goliath, Bill Foster a little bit better. And uh, for me, I'm going to say Ant-Man and the Wasp. It's a good movie. If you haven't seen it yet, go check it out. It's probably streaming on Disney Plus right now. A lot of us are looking for things to do. You could do worse than re-watching Ant-Man and the Wasp. Watch it again to p- uh, pay a little extra attention to Lawrence Fishburne's Bill Foster Uh, Take the knowledge of his comic book history into mind as you watch the movie and see if that changes that experience for you at all. Or if you've never seen it before and it's your first time watching it, you know, just kind of enjoy seeing Bill Foster on the screen. Well, before I say goodbye, I just want to remind you, if you want to follow the show on Twitter, my Twitter handle is at HV Podcast. That's always a great place to communicate. Tell me what you think of the episodes. Tell me what you'd like to hear. You can also follow the show on Facebook. Uh, That's uh, Heroes and Villains Podcast on Facebook. You can go check that out. Uh, It's not Heroes and Villains, and it's not Heroes and Villains Show. I think it's Heroes and Villains Podcast uh, because there's a lot of stuff on Facebook. Uh, If you want to email me, the email address is laundryroombruce at gmail.com. That's laundryroombruce, all one word, spelled just like you think. And until next time, stay safe. And remember, as always... Heroes are super. In a world full of heroes, now sit here counting zeros in a cubicle downtown. I wanna look.